come a long way. She's got good friends in school and she speaks with Natalie. But in order for her to fully recover, Dr. Blum has suggested that she take antidepressant medication. We should start them on very low doses of medication in order to lower their anxiety level. The children are much more receptive when their anxiety is lower. They're able to perform the things that we need them to do. Once Kayla becomes more confident and comfortable in the classroom, she will be slowly taken off her medication. <laughs> the prognosis of selective mutism, when it's viewed from an anxiety perspective, is excellent. These children overcome selective mutism. So if we can give them the coping skills and develop behavioral techniques to be able to deal with a stressful situation, they're able to carry that over into their life as they get older. Now I try to look at things in such a positive way, and I know that you know, we recognize the problem and that we're getting help for her, and she's going to overcome this at a young age. And she won't hopefully have to go through the pain all these years that other people do. Kayla is fortunate. She's growing up in a time when many doctors and families are recognizing this disorder in children. But for socially anxious adults like Chris, the diagnosis took years. Chris is visiting his parents' home for the first time since he has started treatment for social anxiety disorder. The conversation brings up painful memories of a lonely child, as documented by his mother, Audrey, in her diary. But I, I can see going through this, there's a number of times when I do mention shy, and I mean even one particular place where I'm actually concerned about Chris's personality. He didn't want to leave the yard all last summer. Um, he wouldn't talk or even look at others. He wouldn't go to the neighbors' houses and had trouble with Sunday school and library school. Yeah, I, mean, I know there were some problems because I did, didn't feel comfortable. I remember I'd go down to the bus stop and everybody would sit on one side of the street and for some reason I would stay alone on the other side by myself. So There's another aspect in our family. I have cousins that uh, have social anxiety situations, but I have lots of aunts that have had phobias. Grandma couldn't walk around the block unless you and Corey were with her because her, her legs would be like rubber. Um, Aunt B couldn't go on a bus. Uh, they all had heart palpitations, anxiety attacks. It's a chemical situation that has affected just about all 11 aunts and uncles of mine and it's now come down to second and third generations. Very heart rendering to think that you were experiencing these things and and I was would have loved to try to help you with it. Social anxiety affects more than the people who suffer from it. It also has an impact on everyone who loves and cares for them. So do you think you've gotten everything you want to get for your mother for Christmas? I feel at times so sad that she has so much capability, so much intelligence, beautiful woman, uh, you know, has everything in the world going for her, but she can't recognize it. I think at the party, that's extremely painful for me to watch, is somebody uh, that I care so deeply about. You know, when she thinks, okay, um, I'm ugly, I seem unprofessional, all of these thoughts, my first reaction is to just say, you're crazy. I think it's hard because I've always seen so much more in her than she sees in herself. I didn't know I had social anxiety disorder and I, they didn't have a word for it back then anyways. I mean, I was pretty depressed, not very happy. See, I feel bad for even my parents watching this. I cry myself to sleep a lot. But I don't know if I want them to know that. I was suicidal, you know, a lot, and they didn't necessarily know that, but... I mean, I think I have it over in my high school yearbook that I wrote some letter in there. I think maybe I've hidden it that, uh, that I would kill myself at a certain point if things didn't get better. school 
I didn't have too many friends. I was a lot smaller than some of the other kids. I kind of got picked on a lot, beat up a lot. It's especially tough dealing with this disorder, I, I believe, being, being a guy because we don't want to show our weaknesses and um, with the social anxiety, being shy and reserved, that's a weakness. Don't worry, just relax and have fun. You're perfectly safe. So I try to compensate in other areas uh, by doing things like skydiving, uh, getting involved in sports, bungee jumping. I think I did a lot of crazy things to try to show my manliness, I guess. There's always um, outsiders in every high school, but I mean, I, was, I felt like I was on the outside of the outsiders because I was just completely alone but with um, everything I was going through and everything I went through. And it, and it was tough to, just seeing that other people having um, at least some one friend, you know, just to, you know, get through it all with. And I didn't, I didn't fit in with the other kids and all that, so it, I mean, a lot of bad experiences just getting through high school. Just, When we went looking at colleges, I picked the easiest thing I possibly could, the closest thing I possibly could, when, you know, at that time in my life, I should have been looking for something challenging and exciting. And I went to secretarial school. It was the easiest thing I could think of. I knew how to type. I knew how to do all that stuff. I wouldn't be threatened. I wouldn't be challenged. And it would be easy. I further progressed in college. I would miss my classes. I would. I sleep on the couch all day, um, just a lot of depression. I drank a lot. Um, if I drink, then it eliminates some of the anxiety. I feel a little more comfortable talking to people. One study showed the median age of uh, onset of social anxiety disorder was age 13. That means that there were a lot of shy, anxious, socially inhibited children who were probably labeled by their teachers as model students because they're not disruptive, they don't disturb anybody, they're quiet. And it's probably not recognized that these children are terrified to raise their hand, having a lot of trouble making friends because they get nervous in these social situations. And these children have a very, very high risk to grow up, to continue to have these problems, to develop depression, and also to develop substance abuse problems because a large number of people with social anxiety disorder realize, unfortunately, that alcohol is one way to calm you down in a social situation. So we really want people to pay attention to this, even in school-aged children. For socially anxious children like Pam, Chris, James, and Barbara, there was no diagnosis and no treatment. Constant anxiety caused them to develop other disorders like depression. And the way to deal with acute shyness, they were told, was to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Get over it. Snap out of it. Um, I don't think that really works, but that's our attitude toward people with mental health problems, behavioral problems, and emotional problems. So that I think that people tend to think, well, this is just the way I am, and I'm going to get laughed at if I try to get help for it. I went to visit my friend in western New York, and she had one TV channel on her TV. And all of a sudden, this commercial came on for a social anxiety series of tapes that was supposed to help you get past this social anxiety. And they started listing the symptoms. Yeah, I said, oh my God, that's me. That's me on that tape. I started to cry, because <laughs> it just, there was a name for it. <laughs> There was a name for it, and something existed. And it looked like I could get help. I'm sorry. Social anxiety disorder was misunderstood for years, until 1985, when Dr. Michael Leibowitz published a paper about its devastating effects. Dr. Leibowitz started the first anxiety disorders clinic in the United States. In the last 15 years, we've recognized the disorder, we've described it, we understand something.